That's not D&D. I didn't understand at the time why D&D can't be both. And also be so much more. What do you get when you mix a plum, an octopus, and a goth kid? At last! Recognition! That's right, an elithid, or as you might know them, a mind flare. Add a little weekend of Bernie's and you've got yourself an Alhoon, aka an Alithilich. Both really fun words to say. I am Ivan with Many Realms, and today Ed Greenwood is here to tell you all about these beloved, but tentacled, and sometimes bewildering, monsters. With the Shattered Obelisk having just come out, which heavily features Mind Flayers, Ed wanted to open the door for you all to ask questions that might not have been thoroughly answered in the adventure, and to encourage you to flay that mind so that when you get around to running it, you have the best experience possible. So be sure to leave those questions down in the comments or check out Ed's Discord or his Patreon. I'll make sure to leave links to that down in the description. And so, in our ongoing rides through the realms, we've come at last to the goth, fashion conscious, as in jet black slinky is the new jet black slinky, disgustingly nauseating move, unquote, tentacle-faced brain eaters. Mind flares, or as they later wanted to be called, the illicit. Mind flares have been in D&D from the beginning and have evolved in powers and specifics as the game has progressed through the editions. I played my small part in this, creating illicit liches, also known as Elhoon, as my addition to this brain-eating, mind-blasting superior race, as well as adding many small cultural touches that subsequent designers either ignored or picked up on and developed. Some of those designers watched a certain Star Trek movie and put it together with the Thulu Mythos tales they'd enjoyed in their youths and adopted the idea of the oozing tadpole or leech or flatworm that crawls into the brains of victims, leaving a trail of slime into ears or up noses to turn said victims into, in this case, new mind flayers. So in D&D, things progressed from these baddies mentally stun or paralyze or sleep you and then run their tentacles into your head to devour your brain and enjoy your emotions and acquire your memories so they know where you hid your treasure and who's nearest and dearest to you so they can go after them too, to these aliens want our brains to turn us into more of them. This wrinkle was introduced in the Lords of Madness 3rd edition book and is now firmly part of the 5th edition version of Mind Flayers, which makes for some fun storytelling plots, such as we see in the Baldur's Gate 3 computer game. No, no, I won't spoil it for folks who haven't reached that far in the game yet. Let's just say that the creepy mind control possibilities of mind flayer tadpoles can now be used to drive and explain a lot of character behaviors in a game. I find this very alluring as a storyteller and designer because it reinforces what we got early on. The idea that this superior race stood back and let minions fight for them, so they became, in the background, big boss monsters, kingpins who could watch what the player characters did and deploy their minions accordingly. In the hands of some dungeon masters, this just means an upgunned gauntlet of traps and foes the player characters have to wade through. But in a campaign with plots and subplots and intrigue, it just begs the opportunity for a dungeon master to have mind flayers manipulate the player characters into attacking here, that is, this obstacle or foe of the mind flayer, and then there, the next foe or obstacle, making the player characters do the mind flayers work for it. And like all superior races, the mind flayers aren't really superior, they're just super powered. That is, they may think they're better and have a handful of really useful abilities we don't, but they don't behave any better than we do. If they have a master plan, that plan varies from elder brain to elder brain and is usually followed only with surveillance and coercion. Left to their own devices, mind flayers have bitter feuds with each other and vie for supremacy, one rival elithid trying to outdo another, meaning the player characters end up whipsawed as one manipulation pushes them one way to run smack into a competing manipulation pushing them back that way. I was also fascinated by how mind flayers would interact with other selfish geniuses in the setting, like beholders and elder dragons, and which so-called lesser creatures they'd turn into their minions, and how. 
Would a mind flayer or beholder seek to manipulate, say, dragons into breeding so they could get the dragon eggs and rear their own mind-controlled dragon hatchlings? For that matter, is that what all those dragon-riding evil human wizards do? Such thoughts led me to craft places in the realms where mind flayers hid behind the scenes and controlled city lords and barons or dukes who ruled parts of kingdoms, which was fine when I was just writing stories in my realms and playing D&D in the Home Realms campaign. But when the realms became a public setting, with the satanic panic raging, staff designers who found these lurking backroom kingpins were in a great hurry to write them back out of existence to restore free will to player character heroes and to remove all that evil insidious influence stuff that might give holy foes of the game ammunition to ban it in more places than they'd already managed to. I have spells. I'm going to fly. If you're enjoying this video, please leave me a like or subscribe. If you want to see other videos in the future, please hit the bell icon. And if you want a steady stream of Realms lore, please jaunt out to my Patreon, Ed Greenwood on Patreon, and consider becoming a protector of the realms. I didn't want huge lithid empires, or even one big one age-old and malignant. I wanted a plethora of independent, scattered, hidden individual mind flayers all trying to run their own show, controlling humans like cattle and curating their collections of cattle and feeding on their thoughts and memories as if such things were fine wine and reacting viciously when they ran into the manipulations of other mind flayers, reaching out shadowy tentacles of their own manipulations. When I outlined such thoughts to a TSR management person at a lunch in Lake Geneva, the reaction was a shudder and the words, that's not D&D. d, &D. D exploring a dungeon and hacking apart horde scaly monsters and taking their treasure. I didn't understand at the time, and still don't, why D&D &D can't be both. And also be so much more, such as befriending or even romancing the monsters, not reacting to any being encountered with swift, slaying violence. So, like doppelgangers, which mind flayers would co-opt as minions and work with, I saw mind flayers as scattered throughout the human-dominated do society that the game gave us, the settled, civilized realms of the Sword Coast and Heartlands, and the realms all around the Sea of Fallen Stars, hiding within the human cities, in back rooms and cellars, behind their layers of minions and using magic to conceal their true appearances until they were close enough to reach out with their tentacles and bring the mind doom. Now, wanting to put tadpoles in our heads to control us directly and make us into new mind flayers gives a sinister and plot useful enough master plan for any superior race, to be sure. And it makes sense to me that the tadpole implanter would be able to control, or at least dominate, the new mind flayers its tadpoles created, so as to assemble its own small army of mind enslaved followers. But I find it far more interesting for storytelling purposes if each mind flayer is independent and has its own different master plan, so we can't predict what they're manipulating us all towards, aside from offering up our brains and ultimately bodies, that is. Perhaps this mind flayer wants to master a particular sort of magic by assembling wizards skilled in crafting and experimenting with new spells of that sort. And to not stifle that creativity, the mind flayer can't mind control them. So has to assemble a cadre of controlled manipulators around those wizards to spur them on and spy on them to coax the desired results out of them without controlling them. Perhaps it's considered bad sport among the lithids to tightly control the cattle as opposed to deftly steering them so they do what you want them to do without being controlled. Perhaps it's considered best or superior to make them change their attitudes by themselves through manipulations and arranged experiences rather than directly controlling their minds. Don't we all want to be loved for ourselves 
not force obedience and feigned love on those weaker than us? Such philosophical musings spawn fun story ideas, which is why mind flayers and beholders and dragons have always been shiny tools in my dungeon mastering and storytelling toolbox. I have some ideas up my sleeve for deployment in the Home Realms campaign after official Wizards of the Coast game releases reveal more of what stories the staff designers want to explore. Which means we will get around to talking about Mind Flayers again. Which is probably when I'll tell you about Torm the Thief reaching down from a ledge to grasp Mind Flayer tentacles sidling towards the sleeping face of a noble lady of Cormir and firmly tie those tentacles in a knot with each other. And the squalling that ensued, and the triumphant glee around the gaming table it caused. Some memories never get old. Ask any illicit. Welcome back to Realm Speak, and this time around we're doing this. The elvish word that the elves use to refer to themselves collectively, the entire uh, elven race. Uh, Tel Kassir, which it can also correctly be pronounced Tel Kassir, refers to the people. Tel Kassir or Tel Kassir. You can, you can lengthen the A if you wish. And no elf will look at you askance. They'll just think, oh, a southerner. A southerner would lengthen that A. Tel Kassir or Tel Kassir. Northerner, Kassir. Southerner, Kasir, or someone who's been taught by a Northerner or a Southerner. Gosh, language is so complicated. 